In the future, people are going to think about the early years of computing. They're going to wonder what it was like living through and being part of the golden age of computers. It was the dawn of the computer era and the time of the personal computer war of the 80s. It was a time when there was over 10 different personal computer platforms to choose from, not just IBM PC and Macintosh. It was a time when 16K was considered to be a lot of memory and a time before Microsoft Windows. Well, since I lived through and experienced that crucial time period in Earth's history, I feel that it is my duty to tell my story in this episode of Retro Geek Computers. Hello, my name is Hans George Campbell. In this episode of Retro Geek Computers, I'm going to talk about my experiences with the early years of computing. What was it like living through and actually being part of the golden age of computers? Well, it all started in the summer of 1981. I was living in Lakeland, Florida at the time. My friend David saw an advertisement in a magazine for a Timex Sinclair ZX81. The computer was a kit that you put together, and it cost around $100. When the package arrived in the mail, I helped David assemble the computer. Afterwards, we hooked it up to a TV and programmed it with its built-in BASIC. The computer only had 1K of RAM, and the video was in black and white. There was no video coprocessor, so the computer was slow. After buying and plugging in a 16K memory expansion cartridge, David and I was able to program larger programs. Around December of the same year, I moved to Portland, Oregon. In 1982, my friend Julius and I had decided to share the rent on an apartment on 14th Avenue in downtown Portland, Oregon. One evening, he came home from work and told me that he was thinking about getting one of the new Commodore VIC-20 computers. The following Friday, he bought the computer and brought it home. I could tell that Julius was very excited about his purchase. I watched as he unpacked the computer and hooked it up to an old black and white TV using an RF modulator. There was no hard drive or even a floppy disk drive. Programs had to be saved and loaded from cassette tape. There were also program cartridges that plugged into the rear of the computer. At first, I did not know what to think. I just sat there and looked at the computer. I did not realize it then, but that little Commodore VIC-20 would soon change my life. The first computer game that I ever played was called Adventureland. It was a text adventure on a cartridge. I have fond memories of my friend Julius and I playing this game one night while drinking beer. I sure loved that VIC-20, and I used it so much that Julius eventually gave it to me and bought himself another one. Here is a Commodore VIC-20. It was the very first computer that I ever owned. In fact, this was the first computer for many people. The VIC-20 was sold from 1980 to 1985. It was the first computer sold in Kmart. William Shatner of Star Trek fame was the spokesperson for Commodore and did the VIC-20 advertisements for the magazines and television. The VIC-20 has a MOS 6502 microprocessor which runs at 1 MHz. The graphics are handled by the VIC chip which can display a maximum screen resolution of 176 by 184 pixels. The computer comes with 5K of memory which can be expanded by plugging in an 8K, 16K, or 32K RAM cartridge. In January 1983, the VIC-20 became the first computer in history to pass the 1 million unit mark. At its peak, 9,000 units per day were produced, and a total of 2.5 million units were sold before it was discontinued in January 
Here is a 16K memory expansion cartridge for the Commodore VIC-20. It adds 16,384 bytes of memory to the computer. This RAM cartridge can be plugged directly into the back of the VIC-20 or used with the VIC-1210 expansion module for additional expansion capability. The 8K version of the cartridge has four dip switches inside the case for setting up the memory locations. I can remember back then thinking to myself, if I only had another 16K of RAM, then I could really do some neat things with my VIC-20. Scott Adams was contracted to provide a series of cartridge-based adventure games. With help from a Commodore engineer who came to Longwood, Florida to assist in the effort, five of Adam's current adventure games were ported to cartridge format. They got around the limited memory of the VIC-20 by having the 16K games reside in a ROM cartridge instead of being loaded into main memory via cassette. The games were entirely text-based and had no graphics yet they sold very well. The first run of the five cartridges generated over $1,500,000 in sales for Commodore. Here are two of the five text adventure games by Scott Adams. Adventureland is the first computer game that I ever played. To load one of these games you would type sys32592 and hit the return key. This poker game is an early cartridge for the VIC-20. Like many of the early 80s computer items, it was made in Hong Kong. Notice that the label is made out of brushed aluminum instead of the glossy paper labels found on later cartridges. The Bally Midway Arcade Classic Omega Race was ported to the Commodore VIC-20 computer. Here it is, brand new, still sealed in its original box. Notice the colorful VIC-20 logo. Under the logo, the words, the friendly computer, are printed. Also notice the eye-catching box art. Here is another game for the Commodore VIC-20, Buck Rogers, Planet of Zoom, by Sega. The back of the box has a description of the game and a screenshot showing what the game looks like. The coin-op arcade game Sidewinder was ported to the Amiga and Atari ST. It is considered to be one of the best shoot 'em up games for those computer platforms. But not many people know that there are also VIC-20 and C64 versions of the game. Well, here it is, the Commodore VIC-20 version of Sidewinder. It is brand new and still sealed in its original box. The game is on a cassette and requires an additional 8K of memory. Here is another game cartridge for the Commodore VIC-20 computer. This one is called Atlantis. Notice the very colorful artwork on the front of the box. You have to remember that for many people, the VIC-20 was their first computer. So the hardware and software companies wanted the packaging for their products to appear non-intimidating and user-friendly. They did this with eye-catching graphics and vivid colors. On the back of the box, there is a description of the game and a screenshot of what the game looks like.
Every month, I bought the Compute and the Compute Gazette magazines. I learned a lot about my new VIC-20 by reading the interesting articles. There were also basic and machine code programs in each magazine that you could type in and run. After a while, I started seeing articles and ads for the new Commodore 64 computer. It was more powerful than the VIC-20, and I knew I just had to have one. So I went out to my local department store and bought the whole system. I bought a Commodore 64 computer, a Commodore 1702 color monitor, Commodore 1541 floppy disk drive, and a few Commodore 64 programs. I really enjoyed playing games on my C64, and I even created a few of my own. I also used my C64 for music and the demo scene. I sure had a lot of fun with that computer. After about three years, I had enough floppy disks full of Commodore 64 software to fill up a four-drawer filing cabinet. This is a Commodore 64 computer. It has a 6510 microprocessor running at 1 MHz and 64K of memory. The video is handled by the VIC-2 chip which displays 16 colors at a screen resolution of 320 by 200. Sound is handled by the SID chip, a sound processor so good that they were also used in early PC sound cards. The Commodore 64 computer was produced from 1982 to 1993. During its lifetime, sales totaled 30 million units making it the best-selling single personal computer model of all time. The computer played such an important part in early computer history that one is displayed in the Smithsonian Institute. Approximately 10,000 commercial software titles were made for the Commodore 64, including development tools, office applications, and games. The machine is also credited with popularizing the computer demo scene. One of the nicest peripherals ever made for the VIC-20 and Commodore 64 computers is this hinged dust cover by CompuCover. This durable, high-quality plastic cover offered long-term protection against dust, spills, and keyboard damage. In the up position, the cover is a handy copy holder. If your computer was directly in front of a TV or a monitor, the cover could easily be removed. I remember having one of these dust covers on my own Commodore 64, and I really liked it. Here we have a Commodore 1541. It was the best-known floppy disk drive for the Commodore 64 home computer. The 1541 was a single-sided, 170 kilobyte drive for five and a quarter inch disks. The disk drive used group code recording and contained a MOS 6502 microprocessor. Doubling as a disk controller, and onboard disk operating system processor. The number of sectors per track varied from 17 to 21, an early implementation of zone bit recording. The drive's built-in disk operating system was CBM DOS 2.6. CBM DOS could transfer only about 300 bytes per second, which translated to about 20 minutes to copy one disk. 10 minutes of reading time, and 10 minutes of writing time. There were two versions of the 1541 mechanics. Early models used a drive mechanism made by Alps Electric, distinguishable by its push-down drive door. Later models utilized a drive mechanism manufactured by Neutronix, Mitsumi, which used a lever release. The 1541 became the first disk drive to see widespread use in the home, and Commodore sold millions of units.
1988, Commodore released the 1541-2, which used an external power supply to provide cooler operation and allow the drive to have a smaller desktop footprint. The power supply brick being placed elsewhere, typically on the floor. The 1541-2 has the more modern radial handle locking mechanism. This is a Koala pad. It was produced from 1984 by Koala Technologies. Originally designed as a low-cost computer drawing tool for schools, this graphics tablet was very popular with Commodore 64 users. For quite a while in the 1980s, Floppy disk users could purchase a special tool called a disk notcher. It would allow them to cut a second right unprotect notch in five and a quarter inch diskettes and thus use them as flippies, either inserted as intended or upside down. Both sides could now be written on and thereby the data storage capacity was doubled. Here are three very popular cartridges for the Commodore 64. This is the final cartridge, which provided over 60 new functions to the C64 user, a fast loader and saver with an acceleration factor of 10, a freezer, and a monitor. Additionally, there is a graphical user interface. The graphical look of the desktop was borrowed from Amiga OS 1. This is the Super Snapshot cartridge. It was considered by many C64 users to be one of the best floppy disk archivers on the market. The cartridge also provided a fast loader utility, a DOS wedge, a screen dump utility, a machine language monitor, and a utility menu. This is the Ice Pick cartridge, a very powerful floppy disk copier. Rather than duplicating disks, IcePick copies the program to disk as it runs in the Commodore 64's memory, thus creating a snapshot image of the entire RAM, I.O., and CPU status. From this image, IcePick can create a compact auto-booting file. Because these files are unprotected, several games could be saved on a disk. This is Geos, an operating system from Berkeley Softworks, later GeoWorks. It was designed for the Commodore 64 and released in 1986. It provided a graphical user interface for this popular 8-bit computer. Geos closely resembled early versions of Mac OS and included a graphical word processor, GeoWrite, and paint program, GeoPaint. For many years, Commodore bundled GEOS with the C64C. At its peak, GEOS was the third most popular operating system in the world in terms of units shipped, trailing only MS-DOS and Mac OS. Unlike many pieces of proprietary software for the C64 and C128, GEOS took full advantage of many of the add-ons and improvements available for these systems. Commodore's 1351 mouse was supported by GEOS, as were its various RAM expansion units. GEOS 128 also fully supported the C128's 640 by 200 high-resolution VDC display mode through a compatible RGB monitor. The C64 version of GEOS incorporated a built-in fast loader called Disk Turbo that significantly increased the speed of drive access on the slow 1541. GEOS 128 could take advantage of the C128's enhanced burst mode in conjunction with the 1571 and 1581 drives.
here are um, two books that uh, actually taught me how to program uh, my own Commodore 64 computer. Uh, here's book one and book two. Um, I think I'll show you the inside of book one because it's, it's a pretty nice book. Inside the book, you know, they show you uh, the Commodore 64 computer. Let me get the book centered here in front of the camera. But they show you the Commodore 64 computer and they talk about, you know, the different parts of the computer. And the thing I liked the best about these books was that they were written in plain, simple layman's terms. You know, in simple English that just about anybody could understand. And these books were very helpful um, back in the early 80s uh, in teaching me how to program my own Commodore 64 computer. But we'll continue looking inside the book. There's pi a picture of the actual inside of the computer and it talks about the different parts of, of the motherboard and, and, and things. Okay. And then, see, so it continues on talking about the, the keyboard itself. It's very important because you'll be using those keys to program, you know, the computer. And then there's the complete setup, you know, the Commodore 64, the 1702 monitor, the 1541 disk drive is all hooked up, showing you a picture of what the system looks like. And then here's a screenshot of the startup basic screen. That's what uh, you're presented with when you, when you first turn on the Commodore 64 computer. And then the book goes on into, you know, teaching you how to program the computer. And it's very well written, lots of nice pictures, you know. I mean, it's just a very nice, well-written set of books. Book two is the same way. Um, I think I think book two basically dealt with more of, of the the sprites and the graphics and the sound, music, things like that. That's what book two I think dealt with. But it's basically the same style. It's I think a continuation of the first book, basically. But I just got I just had to show show you these books because they're very nice. These are the books that taught me how to program my own Commodore 64 system. And I just have to show them. I promised myself that when I did this video that I would show these books because they're really nice. As you can see, it's teaching you how to make your sprites, you know. It's teaching you how to make the different graphics. Yeah. Pretty nice books. I think uh, this book even had a couple of programs that you can actually type in to the computer. I mean, full programs, like uh, I think there were like a couple of games or something that you can actually program into the Commodore 64 computer. Computes Gazette was a computer magazine of the 1980s directed at users of Commodore's 8-bit home computers. Publishing its first issue in July 1983, the Gazette was a, a Commodore-only daughter magazine of the computer hobbyist magazine, Compute. Compute's Gazette contained both standard articles and type-in programs. Many of these programs were quite sophisticated and lengthy. To assist in entry, uh, Gazette published several utilities. The automatic proofreader provided checksum capabilities for basic programs while machine language listings could be entered with MLX. Starting in May 1984, a companion disk containing all the programs from each issue was available to subscribers for an extra fee. 
Towards the end of the 1980s, the magazine's size steadily decreased due to the increasing switch from 8-bit to 16-bit home computers. The last standalone issue of Computes Gazette was published in June 1, 1990. Okay, now I'm going to show you um, some computer magazines from the 80s. This one here is Info 64. It shows the complete uh, Commodore 128 system on the front cover. And it also shows the Commodore LCD portable computer. Next we have an Ahoy magazine, very popular magazine with Commodore 64 users. Next we have a run magazine showing a few of the um, disk drives that were available for the Commodore computers. Here's another run magazine uh, that basically one of the main articles was making music on your C64, which was, uh, that was very popular in the 80s. Okay, here's a run magazine showing the, well at that time, the new Commodore 128. See? And it shows uh, the complete system right here, the monitor, the computer, the, the disk drive, and even though I think this was a modem right here that plugged into it. But this was uh, one of the first magazines that actually showed the new Commodore 128 computer. Here's a Commodore magazine that once again shows the Commodore 128. Uh, computer. Um, the Commodore 128 was very popular. I mean, it was basically the king of all of the 8-bit computers. It was a very nice, uh, very nice computer system. Uh, it was basically three computers in one. It was a Commodore 64 computer, so all of the 10,000 Commodore 64 programs would run on it. Um, it was a Commodore 128 computer, and it was a CPM computer. Um, one of the nice things about the Commodore 128 is that it was one of the first Commodore computers that had a full-size professional keyboard. It was also one of the first computers that had a, had a high-resolution 80-column uh, RGB screen mode. You can actually uh, hook this computer up to a high-resolution RGB color monitor. Um, but, you know, the Commodore 128 system was very popular. And finally, we have a run magazine here that shows a picture of the Commodore Plus 4 computer. The reason why it was called Plus 4, I believe, is because it had four built-in application programs. Um, it was actually a very nice-looking, futuristic uh, computer system. I really liked it. I think the main reason why it didn't sell very well, it didn't take off very well, is because you couldn't run Commodore 64 software on it. You could only run Commodore 16 or Commodore Plus 4 uh, software on it. So the computer didn't really take off very well. By 1985, I had a Commodore 64C system and a Commodore 128 system. I remember reading an excellent magazine article on how to build your own IBM PCXT computer. Since I was getting bored with the 8-bit machines, I decided that this would be a cool thing to do. So I ordered the various parts needed and put together my first PC compatible. 
It had an 8088 processor, 640K of RAM, a color graphics adapter, a 20 meg hard drive, and two 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk drives. Sound cards had not yet been invented for the PC, so there was no sound card. As for the operating system, I installed IBM PC DOS 3.3 and the GEM desktop. Around October, I went to the mall to buy more software for my new PC. While shopping in, the, in this one store, I noticed a computer sitting by itself in a corner. There was a demo running which showed a ray-traced figure juggling three silver spheres. As I stood there watching the demo, I was amazed at the computer's graphics and sound capabilities. So I asked the store manager about the computer, and he said that, my friend, is the new Atari 520 ST Super Micro Computer. I told the store manager about the PC compatible computer that I had built and asked him if he would be willing to trade me an Atari 520 ST system for it. He told me that he most likely would, but he would have to see the computer first. So I rushed home, picked up the computer, and brought it back to the store. As the store manager examined my PC compatible, I could tell that he was very impressed with the way it was built. He told me that, it, that I did a great job and that, yes, he would do the trade. I received an Atari 520ST computer, an Atari SC1224 color monitor, an Atari SF354 disk drive, and an Atari SF314 disk drive. The store manager also allowed me to make copies of some of the Atari SD software that was laying around the store. I was very excited when I took the computer home, and I will never forget that day. The Atari 520 ST was my very first 16 32-bit computer. Here we have an Atari 520 ST. This computer has a Motorola 68000 microprocessor running at 8 MHz. The machine came with 512K of memory, which could be expanded to 4 MB. There are three video modes, low, medium, and high resolution. The low res mode displayed 16 colors at 320 by 200 resolution. The medium res mode displayed four colors at 640 by 200 resolution. The high res mode displayed two colors at 640 by 400 resolution, which was perfect for Macintosh emulation, desktop publishing, and MIDI. Sound was three voices and white noise, produced by a Yamaha YM2149 programmable sound generator. The operating system, TOS and GEM desktop, were on ROM chips inside the computer. The Atari ST was released in 1985, six months before the Commodore Amiga. It was commercially available from 1985 to the early 1990s. It is interesting to note that Microsoft wanted to port Windows to the Atari ST platform. Here we have three disk drives for the Atari ST computers. The first one is an Atari SF354 single-sided, double-density, 3.5 inch disk drive. The formatted capacity of the disks was 360K. The second and third one are two different versions of the Atari SF314 double-sided, double-density, 3.5 inch disk drive. The formatted capacity of the disks was 360K or 720K. Notice the front of the drives. The one with the larger eject button is a newer version. These drive mechanisms were also later installed on the Amiga 2000 and 500 computers. Atari disk drives came with an external power supply brick and a cable for connecting them to the Atari ST computer's disk drive port.
This is the Ferrari of Atari ST disk drives, the GTS 100 by Future Systems. Here it is pictured with the original sales brochure. Every Atari ST owner wanted one of these drives, especially users that were into copying software. The nice track display on the front of the drive showed where the read-write heads were on the disk. This helped in cracking software copy protection. Personally, I just like the way the disk drive looked and the high quality metal case. There were many hard drives produced for the Atari ST computers. This is one of the better ones. It is a Supra Drive Atari hard disk made in the USA by Supra Corporation. It connects to the Atari ST's DMA port. 20 megabyte, 40 megabyte, and 60 megabyte drives were available. These Supra hard disk drives were extremely well made. Inside the all metal case, there is a hard drive, SCSI to DMA controller board, and a power supply. Early versions of these hard drives were fan cooled and had an external DMA connector on the rear of the case. This interesting peripheral is an Atari DMA to SCSI controller. It is called the Link and was made by ICD. This device allowed you to attach SCSI devices to the Atari ST computer's DMA port. With it, many of the SCSI drives that were available for the Macintosh computers could be used with the Atari ST. The Atari ST computer had three video modes an Atari SC1224 color RGB monitor was used to display the low and medium resolution screen modes. And an Atari SM124 monochrome monitor was used to display the high resolution screen mode. So you had to have two monitors if you wanted to use all three of the Atari ST screen modes. Well, to keep you from wearing out the monitor port on the back of the Atari ST computer by constantly plugging and unplugging the monitor cables, this handy peripheral was made. The Monitor Master by Practical Solutions allowed the user to have both the color and mono Atari monitors plugged into the Atari ST computer at the same time. The user could then switch monitors by the press of a switch. I remember having one of these monitor masters on my own Atari ST setup. It was a must-have peripheral for all Atari ST users. The Atari ST computer had two joystick ports. An Atari mouse was usually plugged into port 0 and a joystick was usually plugged into port 1. Well, many games required you to have a joystick plugged into port 0, where the mouse is plugged in. To keep you from wearing out the connector, this nifty peripheral was made. The Mouse Master by Practical Solutions allowed the user to have a mouse and two joysticks plugged into the Atari ST. The user could then switch between the mouse and joystick plugged into port 0 by flipping a switch. Also, for those people that had an Atari 1040 ST where the joystick ports were under the computer, this was a handy device for moving those ports to a more convenient location. I remember having one of these on my own Atari ST setup, and it too is a must have peripheral. Here we have two mice for the Atari ST computers. The gray one is an Atari mouse. It has two buttons and a resolution of 200 dpi. 
The black one is a beetle mouse. It also has two buttons, but has a higher resolution of 300 dpi for smoother operation. Around December of 1985, I was working for Hackershack, a store that bought and sold used computer hardware and software. A man named Tony would come in several times a week to put stuff up on consignment. Well, one day he came in with a brand new, in the box, Amiga 1000 computer. I asked him how much did he want for, for it. He told me that he had bought it new, but he needed the money for Christmas shopping. So he let me have the computer for $800, which was a steal. A few weeks later, Tony sold me a Commodore 1080 Amiga monitor and a second Amiga 880K disk drive. The Amiga 1000, with its incredible graphics and sound capabilities, was the finest personal computer that money could buy. The computer was far ahead of its time, so much so that it would take the rest of the computer industry over 10 years to finally catch up. And when it comes to the computer industry, 10 years is a very long time. In 1987, my favorite computer of all time was released, the Amiga 2000. I wanted one of those computers really bad, but did not have enough money to purchase one. So I sold my Atari 520ST system and my Amiga 1000 system in order to get the rest of the money needed. I was one of the first 10 people in my area to buy an Amiga 2000. My Amiga 2000 was mainly used for entertainment. I loved playing video games, especially Sidewinder, Gods, Fantasy III, Silkworm, and the Ultima RPGs. I also enjoyed listening to music modules, watching animations, doing Macintosh and Atari ST emulation, digitizing, and drawing pictures with Deluxe Paint. Even though 1989 and 1990 were the biggest years for the Amiga, I felt that it was time for me to move on to the newer PCs. So I sold my Amiga 2000 and used the money to build myself another PC compatible. 